I want to share an idea that's important to me. And by the end of my talk, I'm hoping it's going to be important to you too. This healthcare card I'm holding is amazing. Everybody in Canada has one. More importantly, we can all use it when we want to access healthcare. But I think the coolest property about the healthcare card is we can choose to make life better for someone else when we die. We can give our organs to someone else and change a human life. And when we do that, we become a healthcare hero. I think this idea can be used another way in healthcare. What I want to do today is talk about three things that aren't connected but should be. Our healthcare card, our healthcare data, and our digital identity. In the course of our talk today, I want to show you what can happen when we have a healthcare card that's empowered for digital healthcare. And I want to show you that passwords, yes, passwords are holding us back. I want to show you that we actually have everything we need to make this happen. And lastly, I want your help so we can make the change happen together. So I can use this card to donate my organs when I die. There's another thing we could donate every single day, except we can't because it's being held captive. Our healthcare data lives on a planet we can't get to. We should be able to see it, we should be able to use it, and we should be able to donate it. The idea is very simple. We can already tick a box on this to say, I agree to give my organs. The simple idea is this. Why can't we tick a box on here to say, I want to share my healthcare data too? This very simple idea could transform healthcare. Here's the interesting thing. As powerful as sharing my organs is, I can only do it once. My healthcare data is something I can share every day, and it's a renewable resource. Data is the fuel that drives healthcare innovation in Canada through medical trials. That's where new drugs, devices, and therapies come from. Medical trials are key to changing healthcare outcomes in Canada, but we have to manage the data, privacy, and consent. Today, medical trials are conducted one study at a time, and the reason is, is that we have to have your explicit knowledge and consent to use your data. The challenge is, is we have no way to ask you to use your data, and you have no way to give or update your answer. So healthcare trials muddle on one study at a time. Dr. Joe Cavazzo works at the University Health Network in Toronto, and he talks about the challenges of delivering medical trials in Canada. To enroll two or 300 patients into an online medical trial costs millions and millions of dollars. It implies getting the doctors and the nurses and the patients and the medical companies all into an online portal so that we can gather and share the data over the course of the study. This implies paper forms and signatures for consent and then issuing user IDs and passwords to everybody. The challenge is this, we set all of this infrastructure up for the trial and then we take it back down immediately after the next, for the next trial because of the data and consent protocols. These protocols are necessary, don't get me wrong. The challenge is this, is when we get an innovation or an insight from the first medical trial and we want to enroll everybody into the second medical trial, none of you have the capacity to opt into that second trial. So what happens is, is that we basically stand it all up and take it back down again and then we start all over again. The password and paper cycle starts all over again. So the point of this is, is that healthcare needs digital identity. Now, I'm going to give you three examples today that kind of illustrate that point. Dr. Abby Gladman spoke at an identity conference I saw in 2015. And he talked about the password problem in healthcare. He's been on the hunt for something better than passwords to provide access to healthcare systems because it's slowing down healthcare delivery. He conducted a study to find out how much password friction was costing the healthcare system. In his study, he found that 3% of all healthcare spend is inefficient authentication, is the word that he used. That means doctors and nurses mistyping passwords and doing password resets. How much does that cost? The Canadian Institute for Health Information says that in 2017, Canada spent $242 billion in healthcare. That means by Dr. Gladman's findings, $7.6 billion is being spent on password frustrations, keeping our healthcare providers from doing the primary task of helping their patients. $7.6 billion. How many nurses, how many doctors, how many MRI machines can we get back in a system where we see that we're constrained for healthcare resources? Healthcare needs digital identity. All of us are buying apps that are connected to the internet, and all of these apps have passwords too. We're buying fridges, cars, watches, stereos, and cars, all connected to the internet that have passwords. 
I bought a BMW in 2010 that came with a cool app. It allowed me to beep the horn, lock the doors, and see where I left the car in the parking lot. I sold that car in 2014. In 2016, I could still see where the car was. <laughs> yeah. This cannot be how it works when my blood pressure cuff is sending data to my doctor, right? This Apple Watch is producing heartbeat and movement data all day long. And it can produce a mini ECG at the push of a button. Apple, I shared this data with Apple because they've given me a strong digital ID to manage the devices I have with them. But I have no way to share this data back with the healthcare system, which would love to have it. Healthcare needs digital identity. So if anybody tells you that my Apple ID password is fluffypuppy123, they're a liar. <laughs> it's fluffypuppy123 exclamation mark because I'm a security professional. <laughs> the point is this. When we have good digital identity, it won't matter if you know my password. And that's where we need to get to. Healthcare needs digital identity, but we need it for the rest of the economy too. The problem is the bad guys. The reason we're doing all this security stuff is these guys are good at what they do. They're out to cause harm. 7.8 billion records of identity information were stolen in 2017 alone. We have this crazy model today where it's easy for the crooks and it's hard for you and I to get access to our online systems. Digital, good digital identity is going to change that. It's going to make it hard for the crooks and it's going to make it easy for you and I. The things we can do online today don't work very well and there's so many things we can't do online at all. I can't open a bank account. I can't register to vote. I can't see my kids' education records. I can see their immunization records and I can't see my healthcare records either. We need digital identity for healthcare, but we need it for the rest of the economy too. I want to tell you a story about how I think digital identity is going to happen in Canada. In 1869, prior to the introduction of the standardized electrical grid, only the largest generators had factories, and the reason they had generators is because they wanted to produce light so they could run two shifts to make more products. That was it. We had generators to make light to make products. And around 1870, the standardized electrical grid was constructed, and there was a massive effort to get everybody to come join the grid. What was interesting at the time is the responses from businesses to this idea of joining a grid. The responses came in two versions of yes and two versions of no. The first version of yes for the small business people, the ones who couldn't afford the generator. This was an easy decision. They could join the grid, they're going to have the electricity, get two light bulbs, do two shifts, compete with the big guys, it's going to be awesome. They joined the grid. The second version of yes came from the guys who had the generator, but they hated it. It was distraction from the business of making products. The problem was it was expensive to run, it was always breaking down, and the guy who ran it was a boozer, and so this was just nothing but a distraction to the business. They said, I love your idea, I'm, I'm in. There were also the businesses that said no. The first version of no where the business says, look, your grid idea is amazing, but I just bought a generator. Come and see me in 15 years. And the second version of no came from the, small, the guy who said, you know what? I like my generator. I don't want anybody between me and my factory. I don't like your stupid grid idea. Go away. What's interesting is what happened in the end. We know by looking backwards that everybody joined the grid. What's even more interesting is once we had cheap, abundant, and available electricity, it transformed the economy. We started using it for everything. It was a sea change in what we could do in society. What does that have to do with digital identity and healthcare? This is the point. Every online web service on the planet is running its own digital identity generator. Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, banks, telco, governments, and medical trials, all running their own digital identity generator. And what we're seeing is now the first versions of this digital identity grid are starting to emerge, which means they don't actually have to run this digital identity generator anymore. Along with many other Canadians, I'm actually working on the identity grid here in Canada. What's interesting is we go to talk to businesses about joining this grid, we're hearing two versions of yes and two versions of no. What we know is that everybody's going to join the grid because the current system is too hard for all of us to use and the costs are not sustainable. Banks, governments, telcos, everybody across the planet are experiencing breaches week after week because nobody can afford to make the massive investments required to keep the digital, the digital identity information safe. So, in 2012, the banks in Canada here got together to launch the first version of this digital identity grid. Many of you have probably used it already when you've used your bank account to get to online government websites like CRA. That's the grid. 
And what's really remarkable, what's happened since this has been introduced, is that the number of Canadians doing transactions online with the government has actually gone up dramatically. More importantly, their business, the business confidence the government has in those transactions has increased because you don't forget your bank password, and if you can't get in, you know there's a problem, you'll notice right away and do the right thing. What's even more remarkable is the government's costs, since they went to this digital identity grid, have come down by almost 80% over the prior generation of service. They've saved $750 million. So as cool as that was, it didn't solve the whole problem. The first generation of the grid was solving the multiple password problem, all of us having too many passwords. What's needed now is a way for each of us to prove we are who we are to get the services that we want online. So what is good digital identity? Good digital identity is something you can hold in your hands, it's easy to use, and it's accepted everywhere you go, like bank cards and cell phones. This new grid that's emerging in Canada is going to allow you to take your bank account, put it together with your cell phone and your government-issued ID so you can create a digital identity for yourself that only you can possess and it'll be, pr provide a way for you to prove who you are when you want to access online services. More importantly, as you go out into business now, businesses are going to like this better because it's more trustworthy for them. It's very unlikely that it's a crook trying to be you. So they can serve you better. Most importantly of all, once we have this grid in place, possession of your user data will no longer be enough for the crooks to masquerade as you and I in these online services. And it's going to deliver privacy and security by design. Dr. Ankavukian, as a great Canadian, is providing great privacy leadership for all of us working on this problem to make sure we get the solution right. There's an organization in Canada called DIAC, the Digital Identity Authentication Council of Canada. I'm sorry it's not a mouthful. <laughs> anyway. This, this organization is a standards organization that's working on making digital identity work for all of us. It's composed of banks and telcos and governments and tech companies all working together to make digital identity work properly across the economy. It's going to make sure that we do this to a standard with informed user consent and privacy. So, modern medical practice says that what you need to do is put the, each patient in the center of their own healthcare story. The term is to create your own circle of care. The concept is that we should all be able to drive our own healthcare bus and bring along the people that are most important to us. I want to bring in my doctor and my specialist, got to bring in the pharmacist, and I want to bring my family in too so that they can see what's going on. And then I've got to load in the blood pressure cuff, and I want to connect to the pharmacy, and I also want to be able to load up my power of attorney and be able to change my end-of-life decisions. We need to equip every Canadian with the tools so they can create their own digital circle of care and take control of their healthcare story. There's a tragic story of a, a Canadian named Greg Price who died of testicular cancer. What's tragic about it is that he didn't need to die. He died because his medical file cup fell between the cracks of the healthcare system. His family had no way to check on the current status of his healthcare file. In this age where we can see where our car is, and I can see where my Amazon package is right now, and I can tell when the Uber driver is going to be at my doorstep, the question Greg Price's family is asking is why? Why in 2018 can we not see our own healthcare files and the status of our medical treatments in an app that belongs to us? In BC, you already have the services card with a chip in it, it's enabled for digital healthcare. All of the other provinces are working at this at different speeds. Canada Health InfoWay has both the, mon the mandate and the funding to create a national fabric for information healthcare sharing for all of us. So, my goal today was to do this. The first thing I wanted to sh share and convince you is that sharing our, health our healthcare data is necessary, achievable, and worthwhile. I hope I also made the case that we need digital identity to make this happen. So, what can you do? You should talk to your elected officials and say you demand a healthcare card that's equipped to participate in digital healthcare. You should also demand to be able to see and use your own healthcare data. When we can do this, when we can see and share and donate our healthcare data, we can all become healthcare heroes every day by sharing our data for medical trials. This is not a technology problem. We have the technology. It's not a skills issue. We know how to solve this problem. It's not a money issue. 
Healthcare costs will come down when we do this. It's an issue of national will. My question to you is, how important is this to you? Thank you.